So I just want you guys to know, I've seen a picture of Pat's fish, and it's true. So, no, he's a good fisherman, but he's lousy at telling fish stories. So, because it's true. So that's good news. I was thinking, you know, Gary McCrary, you saw him, he was up here. He's 78 years old, and he looks distinguished, but he's not. I'm just saying. And um, and and I kind of have a bone to pick with him. I just, this is the first time I heard he got healed 10 years ago when I was praying with him. So I don't know what, you know, um, Nancy sometimes calls him Crazy Gary, and I'm starting to figure it out. But uh, he is a blessing, so. Well, hmm. We're going to look at a lot of different scriptures, and I, I was thinking, in a, there are so many different aspects of how I want to approach this. You know, I was thinking about what it means to minister grace to the hearer, and um, I was actually, when Charlie and I were fishing yesterday, we were talking about different things, and I said, in, in, in the conversation, this was coming up, and I said, well, Charlie, there's, there's two key components to Christianity that people often forget about. That if, if you remove those components, then our faith becomes something else that can look Christian but not be Christian. And those, t- those two key components are faith and truth. And if we remove faith, we have fear. And if we remove truth, we have delusion. And, and we want to guard our hearts uh, with those things. You know, and I talked about guarding your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. And, and how, do we, how do we challenge ourselves when we're being distracted from faith and truth? And, and how do I challenge people when they're being distracted from faith and truth? And yet, at the same time, not breaking bruised reeds and all. You know, that's a tough business. And so I was thinking about what it means to minister grace to the hearer. And, and I believe it, it has a lot to do with letting your speech be an encouragement and blessing. Or you can let it be a discouragement and a source of fear rather than faith. And, and uh, we live in an age of anxiety. And people are often sharing their anxiety. And, 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 and sometimes they don't even share their anxiety. They share someone else's. Right. And, and, you know, I, I like I don't really care for the news. That's it, I've never made that a secret. In fact, I've tried to make people understand I don't care for the news. And I've often thought about it if I said, you know, I don't like to hear people swear or tell dirty jokes. No one would run up to me and tell me a dirty joke right after that. But if I say, I really don't want to hear all the news reports all the time, immediately people want to tell me the news report. And. And here's my point. Repeating these things doesn't always minister grace to the hearer. And there are things that we know, there are things that we are aware of that might not be good for others to know. Right? In fact, when you think of, if you think, well, there's this this whole bad thing that could happen, can the person you're telling that to bear that weight emotionally? Those are good questions to ask. And, and so when I think about that, it's a time when many people are troubled with many things. And I'm reminded, of course, of that we preached on that, the story of Mary and Martha. And Jesus says to Martha, you're troubled about a lot of stuff, but Mary has chosen that thing which is needful. And we know that that thing which is needful is to sit at the feet of Jesus. And we live in a day and age where people are troubled with a lot of things, but they're not really, really at the feet of Jesus with them. They're just letting themselves be troubled with them. And, and I question, you know, I'm challenging that in our lives, that if you're not in perfect peace, what does that say about where you're at with Jesus? And I don't mean that as an accusation. But if the Bible says he keeps him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you or, or resting in you and you're not in perfect peace, it means your mind's not stayed or founded or grounded in the Lord. It's grounded in all the anxiety of our culture. And that's not faith. 
That's the first thing we learn. It's not faith. That it's, a, it's more a spirit of fear than a spirit of faith. And, and the other thing is it's not always truth. And, and we have to always be working with that in our own souls. So if we consider the history of the church, we can note an abundance of people being troubled and focusing on trouble rather than choosing that which is needful. And, and that's one of my... Um, it is one of my fields of expertise, actually, church history. I have a PhD in it. So, um, and, and as you study church history, what you learn from church history is how much of church history wasn't about Jesus. It was about other stuff. And, and, and when we realize, who are we called to? We're called to Jesus. We're not called to the fear. We're not called to the anxiety of the culture. We're not called to the trouble of religion. We're called to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that makes a difference. And and I think about that, that there you see in church history, you see people being troubled and focusing on trouble rather than choosing that thing that's needful. And it reminds me of the church of Ephesus in Revelation because we have the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation, the first couple chapters there. And we read about the church of Ephesus. And he, and he describes the church of Ephesus, and they're amazing. By their description, it's a pretty impressive church. They're endeavoring to be doctrinally sound. They're doing ministry. They're busy. They're helping people. They're trying to keep things in order. They are, by all human definition, the perfect church. And he says, I have this thing against you. You've forgotten your first love. And is it possible that we can be so intense about being the right kind of Christian that we forget about loving Christ? Is it possible that we can get so caught up in our Christianity that we forget our Christ in the pursuit of religion? Can we get so caught up in the details and intricacies of how we think one should worship or behave or vote or believe that we forget to pursue the Lord? And, and, and I know this happens to us. It's happened to me in my lifetime. I, I, well, I know it's happened to some of you because we talk, right? It happens to us as people. And we're, you know, we're all in the same boat, In that regard. And one of the things that happens to us is how many times we are tempted to skip a devotional life because we're worried about the pressures of life. Well, I just I just don't feel I can read my Bible. I just don't feel like I can worship. I don't but that's the very thing we need the most. And we grapple with these things. And so when I was thinking about um Letting our speech be seasoned with grace, I was thinking about that scripture, you know, and I want to read it out of Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 29. And it, it, I'm using God's word translation. No, I'm using a different translation. What am I using here? Lexington Bible or something. But it says, no rotten word must proceed from your mouth, but only something good for the building up of the need in order that it may give grace to those who hear. And, and I think as people of faith and truth, we have to start there. That rottenness can't come out of our mouth because we're people of faith and truth. And, and when I think of what James says, you know, that, that good water doesn't, you know, sweet water doesn't come from bitter well. Bitter and sweet water don't come from the same well. And, and we have to think in those terms that... That if what we're speaking is sounds more like fear and frustration than it sounds like faith, we are no longer ministering grace to those who hear. If what we are talking about points to this world more than it points to Jesus, we're not being people of faith. And those are good challenges. And so I was thinking of different ways the rotten words can come out of us and negativity that leads to fear and apprehension rather than faith falls into that category. And and whenever a challenge occurs, people start spreading verbiage that is troubling rather than trusting. 
right? Every time something, what are we going to do instead of I know in whom I have believed? There's a tremendous difference. And, and, and I find it troubling in, in that sometimes I watch a lot of turmoil while I'm in peace. And it's heartbreaking. That's how I would put it. It's heartbreaking. Because the turmoil that people are in emotionally is unnecessary. Because we know in whom we have believed. Uh, we look for the person to blame. How many know that? As soon as we don't feel well, as soon as something's wrong, as soon as there's a financial challenge, as soon as we don't like how the country's going, what are, what's the first thing we look for? Someone to blame. doesn't even matter if it's their fault. But we, and and here's, here's what I've learned about people who look for someone to blame. You will always find that person. You may not find the guilty party, but you will always find someone to blame. And we think about that, that scripture, that um, how we become blameless. And, and the, the, in the text of that, of being blameless children of God, it's the idea of children. It's literally the idea of children who don't cast blame. See, sometimes we think of being blameless as, well, I'm without blame. And first of all, no, you're not. Right? We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The only way I can choose to be without blame in my life is if I choose not to blame others. If I choose not to cast the blame on someone else. And then we come to this thing what about God's plans? Do they count? Have, you, have we thought in those terms, do God's plans count in this world? And, and I, I often, you know, I, I don't want to talk about current events today. I'm going to only talk about historical things. And, and quite simply, just because it's safer. All right? And so if we go back to the Babylonian captivity, right, that happens B.C., and, and um, the Lord has prophesied that they're going to go into captivity and and at immediately people are looking for who to blame but it was god's idea that babylon's going to come and conquer israel and take us prisoners back to babylon whose fault is it we and we could say well it's theirs for not following him etc but ultimately whose decision was it God's. Where does his plan come into play in the lives of God's people? Does, does God's will matter? Does his plan for life matter? Do the things that he says will take place count? And then I, I, you know, I, I'm, I was thinking pretty randomly, to be honest, when I was going through this. And I would thought next of Romans 12, 15 that says this, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And when I read that, I said, well, Lord, I have done my share of weeping with weepers. When will the weepers obey that command and rejoice with me? See, there, it's so, we're so quick to say, well, you know, I'm feeling miserable. You're supposed to weep with those who weep. And I could say, I'm feeling good. You're supposed to rejoice with those who rejoice. See, it's a two-sword, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? It's a two-sided command. And, and when people are in the habit of weeping, they never want to rejoice. And nothing will ever cause them to rejoice unless everything happens exactly as they demand it. And I don't think that's the calling of the Lord. And, and I, I came to this, you know, honestly, and I'm a, look, I am... A realist, which means I'm cynical and pessimistic. Okay, I know that. 
I analyze everything, and everything goes through that filter, all right? And, and I think the word charm is a verb, so if someone's trying to charm me, I'm like, why are you trying to charm me, and what are you after? Okay, I know that about myself, which doesn't bother me in the least. But in spite of all of that, something has happened where I really like walking with Christ. I enjoy it. I get up in the morning and I sing and I worship him and, and I go for walks and I enjoy, you know, the birds are all over the place right now and everybody's dog seems to like me, and which is better than if they don't like you. And, and I, I enjoy walking with the Lord. I enjoy all the good that God has placed on planet Earth. Have you thought about that? And I would, look, I was a little grumpy this morning, but it just needed to be that way. You know, it was important. The sun was shining and the birds were singing and we were on our way to church, so of course you should be a little grumpy. Makes sense. Except that it doesn't. And, and so I began to come to think in terms of, okay, so we, we think in those terms. What about the difference between the, fact, the simple fact that fear is not faith? No matter what you say about it, fear is not faith. And you can... You can Make your fear try to, you can try to make your fear holy. You can try to make your fear important. You can try to wrap it in scripture. You can try to make it politically important, philosophically important, or practically important. But fear is not faith. And it never will be. And, and so we come to that scripture in 2 Timothy 1 7 that says, God did not give us a cowardly spirit, but a spirit of power, love, and good judgment. And, and in other words, God, in the old King James, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. A cowardly spirit only sees where there, what, where there is trouble and what you can be troubled about. But a spirit of power, and that, that word, uh, a lot of times people misunderstand the word of power in the Greek New Testament is the word dunamis, and, but it means ability. Some of you think it's explosive power because some guy came along and named dynamite after it, but he wasn't a theologian, and he didn't really know what the word meant. But it means ability. God has given you, think about this, God has given you a spirit of ability he has given you what you need to function. That's good news. How many believe that's good news? And, and the, the idea of love. Love is an action thing too. If you read 1 Corinthians, uh, the, the definition of love, those, those are all things you have to do. It's not just something you think or feel. It, it has to be active and real because faith without works is dead. And then we come to the sound-mindedness, good judgment. And I think about that, you know, if that's a description of the church, that if we, if we were to think that when, when Paul is writing this to Timothy and he's describing the church and he says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and, and sound-mindedness or good judgment, then that should describe the church. Uh-oh. Right? It should describe the church, that, that the church should be full of love, power, and sound-mindedness. There should be a healing virtue that flows in the human soul. And if that's not happening within us, then is it because our attention is on the trouble instead of at the feet of Jesus. And, and so you remember the story of the spies that go into the land of Canaan? And there's 12 that go in and 10 of them have cowardly spirits. 
And the land has a conspiracy against him is what they begin to think. You know, we don't dare because of this, this, and this. And I can read it for you. I'll just tell you where it is, and we'll kind of go through the deal. Roma, it's in Numbers chapter 13. It's verses 27 through 32. You could read about it. So what we get is Moses sends them. They come back, and they report, and they all agree on one thing. There's good stuff in the land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. But 10 of them, they're like, we could never take it. It's too tough, right? It's a hard land, et cetera. And, and then um, in verse 30, Caleb jumps in and he says, uh, it says, Caleb told the people to be quiet and listen to Moses. Caleb said, let's go now and take possession of the land. We should be more than able to conquer it. How many, how many end up believing you can't conquer your problem? Right? And if you believe you can't conquer your problem, you're absolutely right because you'll not conquer your problem. But if you believe that you can conquer your problem in Jesus, you're also absolutely right. And, and, and Caleb begins to sway the people apparently because these 10 guys who have a cowardly spirit don't like the fact that people are starting to respond out of faith. And it says in verse 31, but the men who had gone with him said, we can't attack those people. They're too strong for us. So they began to spread lies among the Israelites about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored is one that devours those who live there. All the people we saw there are very tall. Now they saw some tall people, but not everybody. You see how that works? The problem is too great. And one's a voice of faith and one's a voice of fear. And I just don't have room. I, I don't want to make room in my life for voices of fear when I can make room for voices of faith. And we, we see that, that, that sense of ability, love, and good judgment. So then we come down to this is where we really are going to stick to history, right? Because those people in the past were dumber than us. Because we want to believe that. And so I'm going to look at recent history, relatively recent history. And when I say relatively recent history, within my lifetime that I can remember. Um, so it's not recent by some standards. But um, why do so many Christians want to believe such wild things? You ever ask that question? Because just because we're people of faith doesn't mean we're superstitious. Because God is real. There's a tremendous difference between being a person of faith and just someone who willy-nilly grabs wild things. I hope we know that. You know, it's like, why do you believe in God? Because he's real. I wouldn't be a Christian if I didn't think God was real because it's not my nature. And so I was saying, well, why do we believe in wild things? So I was remembering back in some of my own experiences and as a, as a kid growing up in church and as a young adult in church and so on and so forth. And, and the first thing I thought of was the 70s, you right? And, and so I remember this special youth night. And all the youth have to be at the special youth night. And, and, and they start, they get out a record. I think it was Beatles probably, but they get out a record and they're turning it backwards, playing it backwards. You know what it sounded like? Nothing. And then they'd get done to playing it backwards and say, and what they said there just now was, and it was some demonic thing. And it's like, I couldn't hear that in there. And you certainly can't hear it when you play it forwards. And, and there was this whole thing about playing records backwards to see if they put devil, devil messages on it. And that's why you shouldn't own the records. And I think that, and, and shortly thereafter, I backslid and walked away from the Lord and I was a mess out in public in no secret way. I wish they would have pointed me to Jesus instead of records. I wish they would have focused on Jesus and knowing him instead of looking for dirt that scares me. We're not talking about today because that would be offensive. How many remember, I remember in the 80s, I actually got rebuked for eating an Egg McMuffin because the owner of McDonald's was tithing to the Satanist church, according to someone in the 80s, and that went around. And then you couldn't use Procter & Gamble products or brush your teeth with Crest because they had some weird symbol, you know, that was a logo, and that was demonic. 
which all, incidentally, all that Paul talks about in the scripture, right? That meat sacrificed to adult, idols is not consequential if you pray over it. That it didn't mean anything. And then there were the early 90s. I got to be the lucky person to be a pastor during this time when suddenly everybody had to throw away Disney cartoons because they were evil. And here's one. If you bought a gas-powered electric generator from Trinity Broadcasting Network in the winter of 1999, you might have been afraid of Y2K. You remember Y2K? I got to pastor through that. And I had people, you know, oh, we got to do something. I'm like, we're not doing nothing. Oh, no, you don't understand. So I'm pretty sure I do. Not doing nothing. No, we got to get ready. Nope, not going to do it. Did anything happen? No. In fact, I remember it was a week or two after that. Debbie and I were uh, in Eugene, and we went into a Christian bookstore. And they had a special computer program to prevent Y2K. It was 50% off. I'm like, I pointed out and said, you really think anyone's going to buy that now? And you wonder why sometimes people look and think, those Christians are nuts. There's more, and this is history. This is not now. 2012. December 21st, 2012. Anyone know what? That was the end of the world, didn't you notice? The Mayan calendar, and then there were prophets prophesying about the Mayan calendar being right. In fact, every one of these weird ideas had a prophet behind it. The Mayan calendar. The world was coming in because they got tired of writing. Nobody told me about it, so I'm still here. And, and we missed this one because there were other things going on. But December, uh, it resurfaced in December of 2020. Uh, it was, we were supposed to have the end of the world in December 21st, 2020, because they misread the Mayan calendar. But we were so busy being uh, quarantined, we didn't notice when the world ended in 2020. Uh, so in anyhow, uh, in each and every one of these events, there were Christians making a big deal out of it instead of trusting Jesus. When I uh, was an associate pastor, we got a letter, <coughs> uh, uh, one of those form letter things about how Madeline Marie, anyone remember who Madeline Marie O'Hare was? She was the gal that got prayer out of the schools in Massachusetts and um, and she was a, started the Atheist Society and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. She's, the, she's described as the woman the whole world loves to hate. But in any case, um, that was her. And, and I got this letter about, you got to call your congressman because she's trying to take all these religious programs off of the air or something like that. And because I was the low man on the totem pole at the time, it's like, you get to call Congress and see if this is true. So I did. They laughed out loud on the phone. Okay, that's not the funniest part of this story. So time goes on. We start Toledo Foursquare in 1993. Five years later, we buy this building. So by 1998, I have an office in this building. And, and uh, at that point, someone comes in and gives me an email of the same thing. That we got to do something because she's, Christians are signing petitions because Madeline Marie O'Hara is going to do this. She's going to get make all this happen. And I said, she died in 1995. She was murdered in three years ago. I'm still talking about the difference between faith and fear and truth and delusion.
Jesus said, the people who hear the truth will follow me. That's what he told Pilate. Pilate said, what is truth? Truth is not relative. By the definition of truth, there can only be one. And all of this is happening. And, and I, I think about, and I've had to, I've pastored through most of it. And I've witnessed all of it. And there have always been people getting words from the Lord that these things are going to happen. And they didn't, which means those were false prophecies, which means those people were false prophets. And everybody who listened to them was deceived. And we need to rise above that. And, and here's the thing. Maybe you were one of those people. It's possible. It's okay if you were. Maybe you fell for it. Maybe you bought a generator. Now you got one. You can go camping. That's fine. We all make mistakes. But if we follow our fear, we will never know truth. And if we follow our faith, we will always know truth. And that's the difference. See, being troubled about things rather than sitting at Jesus' feet, who are you listening to? When you buy into lies, who are you really ultimately listening to? The father of lies. And, and at what point do you come back and say, it wouldn't matter if all those things were true. I know Jesus. See, if I go back to my youth in the 70s when they're telling me about records, records weren't my biggest problem. My problem was I needed Jesus in a way that I wasn't experiencing him. And, and, you know, let's just, just say that that was happening. I don't think it was. But let's say, oh, the devil was putting messages on the records trying to get to me. It didn't matter. Because the Lord can get to you. It doesn't matter what the... It doesn't matter if, if people give money to the devil. It doesn't matter if, if the world's going to end. It doesn't matter because we know in whom we have believed. And, and incidentally, if there, is this, if there is a spiritual event that's bringing about the end of the world or the demise of Christianity, you can't stop it. No one can stop it without the hand of God. Mankind has already proven that he can't save the world. We must have Jesus. And in him is joy. In him is faith. In him is expectation. So I'm going to read a scripture because we're still in history, ancient history now. We're reading from Isaiah. That makes it really ancient history. All right? And this is God's Word translation. I did look it up in the original Hebrew to make sure it was correct if you're interested. But it says this, Isaiah chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 11 through 14. This is what the Lord said with his powerful hand on me. He warned me not to follow the ways of these people. Don't say that everything these people call a conspiracy is a conspiracy. Remember that the Lord of armies is holy. He is the one you should fear and the one you should be terrified of. He will be a place of safety for you. Did you know there's a scripture verse that tells you not to cry conspiracy theory when everyone else is crying conspiracy theory? We just read it.
In every example I've given, people were pointing to trouble rather than Jesus. That's the big problem. Whether it was true or not true or anything else doesn't even matter. What matters is they pointed to the trouble instead of Jesus. There will always be people who broadcast worry and trouble instead of faith in who God is. I can't do anything about that. There will always be those people. And, and, and there will always be people who will never give it up. But I can tell you, if you're hearing from those people, to caution your hearts. Don't listen to that. Listen to what the word tells us about who God is. That you would be free from the pain of your soul. Learn this scripture. Don't cry conspiracy. Don't fear what they fear. The Lord will place, put you in a place of safety. I love that. That's a, that's a beautiful statement. The Lord, how many believe that regardless of what's happening on planet earth, the Lord can put you in a place of safety? Okay, now we're doing well. Let's see how brave you are. How many believe the Lord has already put you in a place of safety no matter what's going on? How many have been rejoicing over it? I expect a fewer hands than before. How many are going to rejoice over it? Now I expect a lot more hands. And, and all this, as we conclude, is, is I don't blame people for being scared or troubled. It's only natural. I mean, I get apprehensive of things as well. But God is supernatural. It's natural to be troubled. But God is supernatural. And he places us in and puts us in a place of safety. Do you want to live in what's natural or do you want to live in what's supernatural? And one of my favorite scriptures from 1 Peter 3.13 says, who will harm you if you're devoted to doing what is good? And one, one translation, who will harm you if your ways please the Lord? And, and, and you say, well, Charles, why would you talk about this? Well, I think even though we're talking about history, I think it's salient to our times. But from a pastor's point of view, here's what I want you to understand. There are some among us who are here who have not had the opportunity to grow in Christ long enough to shove off the fear that's promoted by a lot of older Christians. If I were to just bluntly say it, which I just did, there are people who are new to the Lord who haven't been with Jesus long enough to be able to say, I'm not going to listen to the fear of some of these people who've been in the church a long time. And that makes my job harder. And I don't like people being afraid because someone else is entertained by nonsense. That bothers me. I believe we should know in whom we have believed. And rise up and be mature people of faith. And know that it, God is in control. And not let our emotions control us, but let our faith control us. And not fall for all the stories, but to trust the truth of God. That's in his word. Oh, that we would be a people that would quote scripture more than the latest newsreel. That dates me because I call it a reel. That's probably the last time I watched the news. But um, to you younger Christians, I would say this. Shove off those fearful things that people talk about. Discard it. Listen to your pastor, not them. Listen to the word of God, not them. God is on the throne. He is faithful. And we have nothing to fear because we are people of faith.
and the Lord is there. And, and some of us have come out of lives that were a lot worse than what people think they're going to experience if things fall apart. I mean, frankly, you know, it's, it's like I've seen some stuff in my life. It's pretty hard to scare me with some of that other stuff. We're already rejoicing at what God has done. Don't take that away. Let's pray. Lord, may your Holy Spirit work in the hearts of every person in this room to birth in us courage, spiritual courage that faces life with an expectation of what God can do, not a fear of what man might do. That you would deliver us from the anxiety of the day the anxiety of the world, the anxiety that's promoted. And, and Lord, you see it. And, we, and I understand your compassion that we are under a constant barrage of, of, of anxiety, fear, and dread. And it's unnecessary because we're people of faith. And I pray, Lord, for that spiritual empowerment as Christians to know in whom we have believed. In Jesus' name that we would be delivered from the muckrake. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. Thank you for being here.